you at sea. If a person robs you on land, they are a thief. But if they rob you at sea, they're a pirate. Let's say it's 2007, and you're the captain of a cargo ship traveling off the coast of the Horn of Africa. You're transporting wheat from Kenya to Saudi Arabia. When you look out at the ocean and you see these guys, they come at you quickly, just a small speedboat of them. And soon they're right up against the side of your ship. They're about to throw a ladder to climb up. Yeah, like, yeah, like, like Captain Phillips. You run into the ship's citadel or safe room and you call the Coast Guard. Or maybe you try to spray them with this water hose to scare them away. But it's too late. They've now climbed on board. They're rounding up the crew. They're going to hold you hostage and demand a ransom of millions of dollars for anyone who will pay. The shipping company, your home government, your family, doesn't matter. And if you don't give them the money, you'll be held in captivity, starving, maybe even tortured, for days, weeks, months, even years. I'm gonna... There's no answer to payment of the ransom. Within three days, then um, uh, the kidnappers here will sell me to, will sell me to Al Shabaab. This happened hundreds of times. This is what a typical hijacking in this region looked like in the early 2000s, where by the end of the decade, Hundreds of piracy incidents were reported every year, Jesus, and they were still heavy. just getting started. That's really scary. So let me show you how the Horn of Africa became the epicenter of modern-day piracy, and how what started as Somali fishermen defending their waters turned into an organized criminal network. This Jesus! Is the rise and fall of Somali pirates. Somali Yo, that pirates boat was fucking zooming! Oh that my god! Back, back. You're dealing with irrational people. If the back is put against the wall, I don't know what they are able to do. Okay, little sidebar really quick. Um, yes, I'm wearing my orange jacket inside because it's kind of cold in the studio. Anyway, one of my least favorite parts about living in the internet age is how tracked I am and how tracked we all are. I spend tracked? a lot of time on the internet and when I do that, all of my data, this, this all of my ad? browsing behavior... I think... Here's a video chat. Pirates aren't one thing. They've always existed. As long as there's been international trade on the ocean, there have been pirates. Sailors who utilize the expanse of the open ocean to rob and steal. Well, not as international, I Sophisticated think. businesses. If you haven't seen CGP Grey's deep dive on pirates, go watch it. It's a two parter. Pirates are everything from Norse sailors who raided other ships on the high seas to the famous pirates of the Caribbean, like Britain's Blackbeard, who stole a French slave ship and souped it up into the ultimate pirate vessel. Pirates were poor men who were looking for money and social mobility. Some of them were looking for fame and glory and power in a time where seafaring men had little status or opportunity in society. We've romanticized them, we've caricatured them, and we idealize I mean, them as- Chat, you think about it, chat, isn't it kind of crazy, chat? A boat is literally the loot, the way out, the security, the defense, it's everything at the same- it, Like, once you hijack a boat, it's GG, you have everything. Legends and myths of the past, but piracy never fully went away. It still very much exists today. Here's a map of all the piracy incidents over the past 40 years at least the reported ones. From Indonesian pirates hijacking cargo ships in the Strait of Malacca, to Bangladeshi pirates holding fishermen hostage in exchange for ransoms, all the way to West Africa where Nigerian pirates steal oil off huge tankers and sell it on the black market. But most of the dots on this map are right here, the gateway to the Suez Canal, one of the busiest highways of global trade, off the coast of a country where piracy uniquely could thrive. The that government of Somalia collapsed in the early 90s. 
the country fractured, and instead of a central government, local clans started to control patches of the country. There was no real government to regulate this 3,000 kilometer coastline, the longest coastline in Africa. As a result, huge fishing boats, mostly from Iran and Yemen, took advantage of this free-for-all, swooping in to these unregulated Somali waters to fish. These foreign fishers would steal that, hundreds of that, millions of dollars of seafood. Yeah, how, how, how long is that like of a, a, of a boat drive though? That seems insane. Every though. year with nets that tear up the seafloor, destroying the ecosystem and depleting the fish stock in the process. Three days. This huh? illegal fishing by foreign vessels started to outsize the catch of locals whose water this was. Local Somali fishermen with their tiny boats couldn't compete. And soon this illegal foreign fishing eclipsed the catch of local Somalis. Oh my god. Around the same time, companies from Switzerland and Somali's former colonizer Italy were illegally paying corrupt factions of the Somali government to take their toxic waste some of it even being radioactive. Tons of this waste ended up in both Somalia's land. Wait, the fish is good and it's like numerous to the point that there's a big market of fish in here and these guys have the brilliant idea to go dump the fucking radioactive shit right down there. And water, um, which would go on to have significant what is effects on the health of local communities. So, it's the 1990s, and between the illegal overfishing and the waste dumping, Somali people's main livelihood is being pillaged by foreigners, and they don't really have a government to help them out, to protect them. So some Somalis decided to fight back. An American cargo ship taken over by pirates. Somali fishermen got together and they formed an ocean militia. Some would call themselves the Coast Guard, and they would use these tiny boats to chase down foreign fishing vessels and demand that they pay a fine. Some experts have called this subsistence piracy because it was piracy, but it was also kind of fishermen defending their livelihood from predatory foreigners. And at first it was rare. I mean, if you look at the data, you just see a handful of successful incidents every year. Oh, and they were pretty basic too. Like in one of these early incidents of Somali piracy, back in like 1994, yeah. you got this wooden boat full of 26 Somali men claiming to be the Somali Coast Guard. And they go up to a shipping vessel and they get on board. They like hijack it for five days, but realize they can't really do anything. So they just steal as much as they can from the cargo ship and just go on their way. Yes, this was piracy, but it was super basic and kind of harmless. It was a bunch of locals filling in on the power vacuum left by their non-existent government. And this is how it was for a long time. Loosely organized gangs of armed Somali um, men. Um, guys, I just can't agree with that. Uh, I just can't agree with... Guys, it's just, <clears throat> I, think, I think as a basis, maybe like the, the message or the core root, yeah, sure. But... The method, methods of doing it and how it were probably carried out, I can't agree with it. Climbing aboard know. cargo ships or fishing vessels, intimidating the crews to collect fines, or sometimes asking it. for informal license fees for fishing in their waters, even though they didn't have any authority to give out licenses. They did it to get money, to basically be like, if you're gonna fish in our waters, you need to pay us. And the rest of the world didn't really know about this. It like wasn't big enough news for anyone to care. But that would soon change. Across the region, 80,000 people are dead. At least 22,000 of them were killed here in Sri Lanka. So there's kind of a turning point. Christmas 2004. This tsunami was devastating, mostly in Southeast Asia, but it also hit Somalia's really delicate coast, destroying homes and boats and crippling an already delicate economy and food supply. The tsunami took the lives of some 150 it's difficult. Are they competing for the fish? Is it like a, is it like if, if somebody fishes, then the other ones don't have it? Or is it they're both doing it or are benefiting off of it? Like, how is it? You can say yes, but I don't think you actually know. Like, I was, I've been listening. Somalia and poisoned the precious little water supply that people had here. And it also washed up some of that toxic waste that had been dumped off their shores. This led to a UN investigation which concluded that the waste was likely causing severe damage to the health of local people. And at this point, Somalia still isn't one country. There's some parts of the country that are peaceful and safe and under government control, but most of Somalia is still a patchwork of competing clans and warlords, a hotbed for terrorism and organized crime networks that control different parts of the country. Back 
And piracy, this thing that started off as an informal coast guard, was maturing in sophisticated ways. By 2005, you start to see pirates using mother ships, larger ships that allow them to go way further off their coast, and then to use speedboats to attack like they did to this cargo ship. This was a huge level up for Somali pirates. These mother ships started to be equipped with radar, which allowed the pirates to have new ways of detecting their prey. You start to see them have GPS systems or satellite phones to communicate. Pirates start looking at shipping industry blogs and databases to locate and track shipping vessels. This was turning from basic subsistence piracy to something more sophisticated. Pirates started to realize just how much money and value was flowing through this corridor, headed towards the Suez Canal, like oh, one of the busiest highways of international trade in the world. And with these new and yeah. improved tactics came more profitable business models that would change everything for pirates. Police in Finland say the owner of the missing freighter Arctic Sea has received a demand for a ransom. It was the early 2000s and it was see, the... See, now it's like, it's like a transitioning. I... Oh, shit. Oh, thank you. I was about to order food. Thank you. I forgot about that. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. No, no, you're good. You're good. That's Nick. Beginning of the era of ransoms. You were kidnapped yeah. by Somali pirates. Mm -hmm and you were held hostage. What's that? Oh, it's all good, it's all good. What's that? Jam, what's that? See, I think if the video, if the video will transition like this, right? Listen, I wish, I just wish there was a, a better, more effort to separate what type of piracy was going on in the sea, the defending the fish or whatever that was going on, right? And that one, which is a canal that a lot of people use for trade, and then they yoink those, right? Is, is, that, is that justified? Is that like, okay, piracy, whatever? The, I think these are both two different issues and solutions. And I think they both need to be outlined in their own, like, unique way. I don't think he did that. I, it just it feels like it's, like, kind of flowing into it. Like, almost like an intro. And I don't know. For more than two years. Yeah. Seems kind of hey, Michael, it's Johnny Harris. Hi, Johnny. Good to, good to hear from you. Hi. So we had a really interesting conversation with this American journalist named Michael Scott hey, Moore. He was kidnapped by Somali pirates and held for almost three years before being released for a $1.6 million ransom. The people say, oh, but they're just frustrated fishermen. Mm. They're not. They were in the 90s, but it was a much bigger deal than just fishermen turning to piracy. Ransoms changed everything. Pirates were realizing how easy it was to hold a ship hostage and to demand a multi-million dollar ransom to extract a huge profit, which attracted the attention of warlords who saw a business opportunity. Warlords now wanted to fund hijackings, like this one where pirates were hijacking a Ukrainian coal ship that was traveling from South Africa to Turkey. They could hold it hostage and release it only in exchange for $700,000, which is what they got. Or another instance where pirates riding on speedboats captured this Japanese ship and its 20 person crew, holding them hostage until somebody coughed up $2 million. There was investment in these pirate operations because there was a return to be had. And by 2007, around 30% of the world's pirate attacks occurred. See, like, like it's because I'm, I'm, I'm people in general, like, Parading and like saying that's victory and, and being all behind them, like are, are are the Japanese like fucking up their waters and fishing? Are they the ones that, that are fucking them over? I don't even know what the Japanese were doing there. You know, like it's just gonna it's just gonna trash. It's just occurred within this circle. But wait, let's keep this in perspective. This actually wasn't particularly high. If you look at a graph of all of the other regions of the world, you'll see that this wasn't by any means an outlier. But watch what happens the next year. This line going up represents the expansion of the piracy industry in Somalia. There was way too much money to be made here, and warlords were getting better and better at investing in and running pirate businesses. By 2009, this body of water off of Somalia was home to nearly half of all piracy incidents on Earth. And look at this graph of the average ransoms paid. In 2008, the average ransom was a million dollars. 
a total of $30 million was paid out that year. And you got to keep this in perspective. These were huge sums of money for anyone, but especially poor fishermen turned pirates in a country with a GDP per person of $517 per year. But even still, this was just the beginning. If you simply uh, refuse to pay, I mean, the pirates have a lot of... I mean, it's a lose-lose. You, you, get, you guys prayed that as a win, right? And people would act super offended and, 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 and mauled if they started fucking gunning them down and laws changed and they just had fucking full AKs and fucking uh, uh, a machine gun on the side of the fucking boat and they just fucking mowed them all down. People would say, oh my God, dude, like they just, dude, they just defend it. Oh my God, dude, like it's crazy. It's like, it's like a lose-lose fucking scenario. It's stupid as fuck. Hostages. And uh, the consequences of You guys say of they do, they don't because of bullshit short, laws and shit. This would be unimaginable. All of this influx of ransom cash kicked off a pirate economy cycle where pirates would attack a ship, hold the crew hostage, and They're get paid them. a high ransom. They would bring this back to the clan leader warlord who funded them, which would make that person rich and allow them to invest in bigger boats and more guns and recruiting more young men and appeasing the local coastal communities who would support them, which they would use to hijack more ships in more sophisticated ways. And it repeated and repeated, getting more and more sophisticated and dangerous each time. So a businessman who, who gets to be so rich that he needs to protect his business interests with gunmen, that's a war. And a, a, a pirate boss is nothing else. He's a, he's a businessman who invests in piracy. The pirate businesses had lawyers and cooks and banknote tellers with machines that could detect fake bills so that they could know if their ransom cash was real or not. There was this great reporting at the time in 2009 by Reuters. One of their journalists went to a pirate town that had been a sleepy fishing village, but had turned into a booming pirate hub or in their words, pirate lair. Oh, they what Reuters found was that this economy was so booming that they had created a stock exchange where any local in the town could invest what they had into a piracy business. There were dozens of these piracy businesses and you can invest in the one that you think is gonna go get a successful ransom by hijacking a international shipping vessel. And people made a lot of money. One local said they made $75,000 in just a couple months because they had made a good bet on the right pirates. Pirate bosses were not just, you know, top pirates. They were investors who had a portfolio of businesses. These pirate businesses would in turn support these communities, help fund the schools and the hospitals in order to curry favor with the locals to make sure that they would support them running their businesses. But the people who were really getting rich here were mostly the clan leaders, the warlords, who were building massive villas and buying luxury cars and throwing lavish drug-laden parties. This was no longer the DIY Coast Guard. This was now lucrative organized crime. And yet, yeah. some of these pirate groups still tried to make a moral case as to why they were justified in doing this, saying that this wasn't piracy, this was retaliation for all of the exploitation of Somali waters by foreign countries. You see this in a 2008 hijacking of a Ukrainian vessel when these pirates demand $8 million, claiming that they would use the money to clean up the toxic waste that European companies had dumped in their waters. Yes, European companies have dumped toxic waste in Somalia. Were these pirates actually going to use the $8 million to clean that up? Of course not. Probably not. At least that's what we found in our reporting. A lot of the moralistic, like Robin Hood narrative became really thin once warlords got involved. And do they, do they even have the tools and the technology to even achieve that in a, in a feasible way or materialize it well, well. once they demanded a return for their investment and you just start to see how thin this moral argument is when pirates start boarding ships and just shooting crew at random to show how serious they were and to increase the likelihood of getting a that's, what money, would, that's, what, my, my, that's what money would be for so some things you can't just instantly buy right one, one thing you're going to realize that in, in the world money sometimes just doesn't fix a problem you need to fix and start building infrastructure so the same way as if you give a country a bunch of money or a charity, you over flood it and you do a big cash injection. What, are they going to fix something at once? No. Somebody who's going to know what they're doing with the money, they'll, they'll, they'll come in, they're going to build an infrastructure, right? And they're going to give them the tools to sustain whatever, whatever project that they're doing. That's how that works. You can't just fucking, oh, guys, 
we got money, boom. Now we know all the technology, all the tools, all the imports, all spawns in. That's how that works, sir. You know, you know, your brain is, uh, unfortunately, the, uh, there is one seaman from mainland which was, uh, who was killed by, by the Somali pirates. Or when they started hijacking UN ships that were full of food and medical aid meant for Somali people. Uh, the ship apparently was bound from Mombasa, Kenya, and the shipment included vegetable oil, corn, soy blend, and other basic food commodities bound for uh, people in countries including Somalia, Uganda, and Kenya. This was about money and power, and it was able to thrive because of a country that didn't have a government that actually controlled the country. By 2011, there were 237 piracy incidents here. Over 1,200 hostages were taken that year. 35 of them died while in captivity. That just fucking stupid. This was becoming more and more deadly and more and more lucrative. Let's go back to that graph of the average ransoms that were paid. So Chad, bro, so fucking, so wicked, so just. Like, these are like, these are like parents. These are like fucking, with that families and shit, like just random fucking workers on these fucking boats to try to make a living, like actual fucking dog shit. You can see it grow up to around $5 million for the average ransom. The total number of ransoms paid in 2011, $150 million. It was getting out of hand, but it would take a few key events for the world to really take notice. Ladies and gentlemen, dear gentlemen, all ships stay inside, stay inside, stay inside. We are trying to stay shut. Try run away from them now. Stay inside, everybody. This is a, a real alarm. Please stay inside. There's this funny thing in international news where in order for the world to take notice of something, it something, sort of has to affect something like that big as Westerners. Happened. And that's no different with pirates. There was this one incident Yep. in uh, fall of 2005 where a group of pirates showed up to a luxury cruise ship it was full of western tourists they hit us with um, um rocket rocket grenades rpgs and um and the they there was a woman in her cabin and she was fortunately in in her bathroom but a rocket grenade went right through and blew the whole cabin out the cruise ship escaped but it still led to global news coverage you're saying this is civilians again, businesses, but there again, you, you fall, you fall yeah. short-sighted. The victim at the end of the day, right, is the, the target is a company, but the actual victim is the civilian. Whatever, it's, it's tourists on this fucking boat, or a worker on, on a cargo boat, it is still civilian victims. That's just how that is. Whether you say, well, dude, that's a company, that's people, they are the same. It's the same thing. The person who actually gets fucked at the end is the, the civilian. Another incident was in 2008 when a Ukrainian ship was hijacked by these pirates. Little did these pirates know, they had just stumbled upon a shipment of tanks and grenades and ammunition bound for Sudan. They were demanding $35 million to give it back, yeah, holding you? the crew and oh, the ship hostage. Hell no. The US and Russia both freaked out here, and they sent yep, in no their shit. navies to like monitor the situation to make sure the pirates weren't going to take the weapons off the boat. In the end, the pirates agreed to a $3.2 million payout, and the secret weapons shipment continued onward. It was a big scare, and it was another step in waking the world up to how big of a deal this was becoming. But the biggest event happened a few months later. A U.S. container ship was traveling from Oman oh, to Kenya yeah. when four pirates boarded and hijacked the ship, holding the crew hostage and demanding $2 million. The U.S. government has a firm policy that it doesn't negotiate with hostages, but what they do do is send terrorists, right? The government has a firm policy that it doesn't negotiate with hostages. Yeah, as well as it sounds like, uh, but hostages, huh? But what they do do is send in their military. So after four days, the Navy SEALs arrived with snipers. They shot three of the four pirates and rescued the crew. It was an incident that was later depicted what in this Tom Dubs? Hanks movie. These were dramatic events, a hostage situation with snipers and Navy SEALs, and it spread into the international news cycle in a way that Somali piracy just hadn't before. But Captain Phillips was taken hostage for almost five days and then rescued by the U.S. Navy. It was, it was clear that this days. had become too lucrative of an economy. There was too much incentive for warlords to get in on all of this money for it to stop. The only way to slow this down was a serious intervention. 
Well, we call As we were Phillips. reporting this story, right. I kept asking, like, why is this such a difficult problem to solve? And we asked all of the experts we interviewed, and we have a pretty good idea now why this is way more complicated than expected. First off, guns. You can't really carry guns on international shipping vessels, partly because there's... Oh my God, it's almost like the entirety of chat earlier was saying, yeah, you can, you know nothing about all this. You know nothing, you don't know anything about it. And like, he just proved me right. I was right. I, I was right about this. Interna guns. You can't really carry Day guns on international shipping vessels. Partly because there's international gun laws that are complicated. Partly because shipping companies don't want guns on boats because it can be a weird liability thing. You can't just have like a gun in a safe box somewhere. Second, it's hard to send in the navies to patrol these waters because pirates often don't look like pirates until it's too late. At which point, they're prone to use their victims as human shields against any threatening navy. So unless you've got like the best snipers in the world, like the navy seals, it's actually really hard to use just like military force against these pirates. And lastly, you have to remember what we're talking about. We're talking about the open ocean, huge swaths of water. It's really challenging to monitor and control this in an effective way. It's one reason why piracy has always thrived on the open sea. But even despite all these challenges, governments and businesses put their heads together and they figured something out. The first one's kind of boring. Armed it's security. This report Look. that this international shipping organization put out that basically teaches ships and captains and companies how to protect themselves. They recommend them using this high pressure hose that allows them to just like spray water at the pirates. Yeah, but they started even... recommending putting barbed wire and razor wire around your ship. Kind of gnarly. Bro, put locks on your door. Bro, any strat will have a counter strat. Okay, I, I, dude, dude. I, just guns. Doors. Uh, Increase your surveillance. Like this is pretty basic stuff. Create a safe room or a citadel where you can like lock yourself in if you get hijacked. But one of the big things they did was create this internationally recognized corridor where ships could all travel together like in a caravan, sometimes escorted by a Navy ship from one of these countries, helping them navigate this really busy but very vulnerable part of the international ship. They're literally playing balloons. And another huge step Bro. was in Bro, they're literally playing balloons. Of all the complicated gun laws, vessels were now allowed to employ armed guards to stand watch as they navigate these waters. So now you've got like security guards with guns on the ship who have nothing else to do but like protect the boat. And guess what? All of these strategies totally worked. I mean, look at this graph. After its all-time high in 2011, hijacking incidents plummeted because of these interventions. Zero! But this leaves us with kind of a complicated resolution here. These communities were left behind by their government. They don't have the infrastructure of a society where people can thrive and work. That's for a lot of reasons, but it's in part because of the pillaging and the exploitation from outsiders. And so while these warlords who committed horrific crimes to get rich deserve no yeah. moral justification. It is morally complicated when you look at yeah. people who are just Yeah, it's really shit. It's, 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 really, it's, really, it's really dog shit. But so is a, like a bunch of countries. Like there's a massive problem, right? I, I think creating a new problem with another, I, I don't know. I, to live whose waters have been poisoned by toxic waste, whose country has been pillaged and who turned to piracy as a last resort. But I'm not gonna go into the ethical dilemma here. I think. You all can fight that out in the comments if you want. Um, I'd love to see what you have to say. The fact is, piracy was solved in the Horn of Africa because of these interventions, at least for the most part. But just as Somali piracy was declining, incidents of piracy started popping up on the other side of the continent. The Gulf of Guinea took Somalia's title as the piracy hotspot of the world. These attacks happened- It's literally a slippery slope in my opinion to justify like really bad stuff where people die and shit like that, people get killed. Um, for whatever cause, I, it's really shit. It's uh, yes, people do say that it's wrong. It's really wrong. I don't think you should do something that's more wrong or wrong. it's just trash, dude. Like I don't and know. For bro. different reasons, and they look quite different. They're usually Nigerian pirates boarding oil tankers to steal the oil that they feel like was stolen from their land. The international community is now turning its focus here, and this is a more complicated thing to solve for a lot more bro, reasons. Bro. The fact is, you say it's a brave take. Right? Like, like, ironically, yet yeah, you fucking go around and fucking parade and you like 
celebratable looting and burning buildings down and yoinking and mass robberies and shit like that. Like just blowing shit all the fucking time for, for whatever cause. I think that's stupid. I think people are drones. They're bots. They're fucking bots. They, they don't justify it. But when, when it's a little bit more like this, oh yeah, I'll justify a little bit of this. I'll develop a bit of that. When they start having a bit of understanding of what, these, of, of what the problems are, then they justify more dog shit. I think it's, I think it's cringe. I, I hate that shit so much. Is piracy won't go away as long as the ingredients that have always been right exist there. Look, look at that frustrated song. young men. His entire viewer no base, they, they, they literally, in an they literally have, like, had emotes to cheer on fucking looters and shit. It's just weird. I don't know. Incentivized and organized by clan leaders looking to get rich on the high seas, operating in a gray area where the government and the society that should support them and employ them doesn't exist or is too weak to help, leaving them to fend for themselves and to turn to more and more sophisticated forms of crime in the process. I'm not, I'm not doing shit. I'm just saying it's, it's a thing that people do. Not only is it normalized, it is currently the, the, the high road take, the, it's the better take to be okay with like destruction, looting, burning shit down, collateral damage for whatever fucking political causes people have and problems they have. It literally is currently the high road take. It is. It literally is. It literally is. It literally is. Because I'm not being paying attention at all. Hey everyone, um, look at this map behind me. I don't know if you yeah, caught it during the video, but this is a map of uh, yeah, mostly of East Asia, but you get this um, Somali Peninsula and the Gulf of Aden, and basically everything we've talked about, it's all right here. It's, it's really a beautiful map. And when you look at it, you can see just how important this Suez Canal is uh, to global shipping. Anyway, um, yeah, I, this, I've wanted to look into Somali pirates forever. Like, I've, I've thought, I've always I saw the news over the years. and Yes, you say millionaire territory, but... You don't know when things are gonna flip, and when things do flip, right? And you sw you swap sides or whatever, right? Then then you justify the people doing that to you, or doing it to others, right? But now you have to justify people doing it to you, and now you have to justify people doing it to other people, and it's because of this whole cycle, like, oh well, I can justify this because people said it's okay. So then people will start picking and choosing what what wrong they do to justify the other people's wrongs, and you can realize at one point that. Maybe the wrongs weren't even wrong in the first place. It's just something you don't agree with. Or you do agree with it. And it all becomes opinionated and it's just politics. It's just cringe as fuck. It's a bad pattern to justify doing dog shit fucking crimes to make it for other crimes and shit like that. It's, it's a stupid slippery slope and you're just too, too stupid to get it. Like, like, like you, 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 you did- Stealing equals harmless classic. Like this guy's been off the, off the hinge these days. But same from, same from Monopoly Corp, it's a pretty different. Bro, they're literally holding hostage, literally fucking fathers of families and shit, and they're dying. 35 deaths of like random civilians because they, they worked for a, com for a company. Like, dude, you think that the company gives a fuck? Dude, if anything, that helps the company. Bro, they don't pay the ransom? Fuck it. One employee dies? Fuck it, dude. I mean, what? what what do you think that ha what do you think what do you think happens when that happens? When it happens? They literally just hire somebody else. They're disposable. For them, it's like foot soldiers on the front lines. They literally just replace one with the other and move it on. If anything, ransoms are bad because uh, if, if they actually pay them. Otherwise, they can just fucking say, fuck it, go let, let them get mowed down. And that's just what happens. The corporates don't actually get fucked by anything. It's the fucking people that get fucked. Companies don't give a fuck. It's like holy shit.